Um, today we're going to be talking about the discipline of service and if you would please do two things. Pass the attendance pads where you're sitting, uh, down the pew that you are in after you've had an opportunity to sign. And then if you would please open up your Bibles to Matthew's Gospel is where we're first going to be, Matthew chapter 5. Uh, we are in a sermon series called Authentic. And uh, the whole idea with this sermon series is we are studying spiritual disciplines, things that, that we need to put and implement into our lives. And the whole reason that we're learning these disciplines is so that you and I can be authentic, consistent, real, genuine followers of Jesus Christ. And these disciplines that we're learning, that we're spending time talking about, that we're spending time studying, um, if we practice these things, we will be authentic. So far where we've been in this series, we've looked at four spiritual disciplines so far. Um, we first kicked off the series by looking at the discipline of personal Bible study. And then we looked at the personal discipline, uh, the discipline of personal prayer. And then we looked at the discipline of fasting. And last week we looked at the discipline of fellowship. And I recognize that the weather kept a lot of us away last week, but it was such a, a good reminder, not only um, for me, hopefully for those who are here, that it's important for us to be together. It's important for us to come week after week and, and to be involved in one another's lives. And I hope that you've been on the receiving end of that to recognize what a benefit and a blessing that is to be together with this church family. Um, if you missed that sermon, it's really important, uh, not because I preached it, uh, but the content and the message of it is so important and for the health of our, our, our body here at Burnside that I would encourage you to pick it up. It's available on CD for free. It doesn't cost you a thing. You just have to let us know you want a copy. And I would love for, for you to be able to listen to that. But today we're talking about the discipline of serving. And I think this message is so timely because it seems now more than ever that selfishness has become a way of life. We think about ourselves, we watch out for ourselves first and, and talk about ourselves and, and we're so quick to want to defend ourselves. Our culture is indeed a me first generation that finds itself in a moral tailspin. And I've oftentimes wondered, is it a moral tailspin in which we will ever recover? We think about all the ways that our time is consumed and the ways that have allowed us to disconnect from people. We have the internet, we have email, we have smartphones, we have tablets. All of these things have kept us from really involving ourselves in the lives of others. Wouldn't you agree? The discipline of serving one another is in direct response to a culture that is consumed with self. And perhaps that's why we find serving so difficult. Today as we talk about serving, I want to talk to you this morning about the purpose of serving. Why is it that we serve? I want to talk to you about the reality of serving. And I also want to talk to you this morning about the rewards of serving. First, let's talk a little bit this morning about the purpose of serving. Why is it that we do what we do? Well, you see, one of the expectations that God has when we come to him is that um, he expects that you're going to step into ministry. That you're going to serve him with your money, your time, and your talents. And really, there are three reasons why we do this. And I, this is something we need to talk about first, too, that um, the way that Christians serve is way different than the way the world serves. Um, we serve because we want to give. The world serves because, yeah, they want to give, but they also want to get. And a lot of times you'll hear about the humanitarian effort of people who serve under the guise of not necessarily of Christian service. But the whole reason they do this humanitarian effort is because, wow, it makes me feel so good to be giving to other people. I'm telling you right now, there's a vast difference between the way the world serves and the way that we as Christ followers are called to serve, okay? And we're going to talk about three reasons you and I serve. Here's the first reason we serve. We serve to influence our communities. You ever heard the phrase, grow where you're planted? That is so true, and that's God's expectations of us, that he has put us and he has purposed us to be in the communities, in the job, in the neighborhoods where we're at. 
And as we're there, and as we're growing, we are called to influence those around us. In Matthew chapter 5, let me set the stage for you. Jesus is preaching a sermon, a very famous sermon, um, um, his first sermon in ministry. In Matthew chapter 5, um, he's got lots of people coming to him who are interested to know what Jesus is all about. And they were interested to know what it means to follow after him. Well, Jesus tells them in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, and he says, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone take a lamp and put it under a basket, but instead on the lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. You see, Jesus tells the people who are following after him that you're light. You're light. You're meant to be used by people. You're meant to be useful and helpful and enjoyed by others. And just so there's not any confusion on what he says, he says this. Why are we doing it? To let your light shine before men. And then he gets real plain and he says that they may see your good works. What Jesus is saying is this. Behave in such a way with those who are unbelievers that when they encounter you, they're going to be better for it. Uh, that they're going to scratch their head or, or put their hand on their chin and be like, I can't place my finger on it, but man, there's something different about those people. Uh, they cared about me. They weren't grouchy or harsh or annoyed. They demonstrated a sincere level of concern for me. In essence, let your actions preach Jesus. All throughout Christ's earthly ministry, he was all the time serving people who had needs. And he did it such sacrificially. And Jesus is saying here, listen, if you intend to follow me, if you want to call yourself a follower of me, you have to serve people who have needs. Use what you have, use what's available to you to impact those around you. And I believe that Matthew chapter 5 verses 14 through 16 those verses are the scriptural basis for every missions trip, every service project, every act of kindness that we do. They're the reason why we serve. And so when you and I do service towards them, we are simply sharing with them the love that Jesus Christ shared with us first. Quite frankly, in the unbelieving world in which we live, where people don't know who God is or, or care with what he's done for them, those people who don't believe in God have no reason to serve anyone other than themselves. So when you and I do an act of service towards them in the name of love, it can't help but get their attention and perk their ears up and cause them to take notice. And why are, they do, why are we doing what we do? What's our motive? Well, it's to influence the communities for Christ. That's why the work of one family, one purpose is so important. That's why the work of, of eight men who left here yesterday morning to travel down to Mexico to build a house is so important. Yes, there's a physical need there. They're building a house for a family who doesn't have a nice house to live in. But I'm telling you, even more than that, they are demonstrating the love that Jesus Christ has for them. And we want them to know the love that he has for them. And it, that's why people look at it and say, why would eight gringos travel all this way down to Mexico to build a house for people they don't even know? And it's because we love Jesus. And we want to influence that community that they're going to with the love of Jesus. We serve to influence our communities for Christ to help them understand what the love of Christ looks like. But we also serve to strengthen the church. You see, we serve those who are outside the church to influence them with the love of Christ, but we've also been called to serve one another in the church. And when we do, it strengthens the church. It builds us up. Because let's face it, sometimes life is more than we can handle on our own. And there are times when we need one another to step in and to help shoulder the burden, to help alleviate the pressures that sometimes life brings with it. Galatians chapter 6, 
verses 9 and 10. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. You know what? Those verses remind me that we're supposed to look after one another. That our top responsibility is to serve and make sure the needs here are met and, and to, to look after one another and to build them up. And we're also supposed to be doing that in the communities in which we live. And when I take time to evaluate and to ponder the ways that this body reaches out in love toward one another, it really makes my heart feel good. It uh, really makes me a little bit beam with pride. Because can I just say, first and foremost, this body is really, really good at caring for one another, at reaching out and serving one another. If there's a need, it's met. And I'm really proud to say that at Burnside Christian Church. When tragedy strikes, you will find this body will be there with a meal, a phone call, a card, words of kindness, acts of service to say, how can we jump in and help? And when we do those things, we are fulfilling Paul's command in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, which simply says, serve one another humbly in love. And I'm so thankful to be a part of a church where this is lived out. And if you haven't yet experienced that, hang around. Hang around. I'm telling you, this, this family of believers is committed uh, to Galatians 5.13. We employ our talents and our abilities not only for the good of the community, not only to strengthen the church, but here's the third reason we serve, and it's the most important reason we serve. We serve to honor God. See, the Bible makes it really clear who it is you're serving. We have this kind of backwards in our mentality. We think that somehow if I came down and I was to help Grant out right there and I was to come here, that I'm directly serving him, but I'm indirectly serving God. And we have that backwards. When I do something nice to help Grant out, I'm directly serving God. I'm indirectly serving him. The Bible makes it very clear time and time again that when we serve, our boss, the one we're trying to please, the one we're serving for, is for God. Galatians, excuse me, let's start with Colossians chapter 3 verse 23. Paul very plainly uh, says, whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. You see, when you do an act of service for somebody in need, you're honoring God with your act of service. That's what we need to understand first and foremost, that when we serve, we're honoring God with that. But knowing whom you directly serve, I think, is of great comfort. Because sometimes in our efforts to serve, if we're serving for people, people can be sometimes unappreciative People can be sometimes kind of mean or, or rude about our efforts to serve them. But listen, if your motive is to honor God, does it matter what their response is? No, it doesn't. And Paul makes this really clear in Galatians chapter 1 verse 10. When he says, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. See what he's saying here? If I was trying to please people, I'd be a servant of people. I'm not a servant of people. I'm a servant of Christ. He is the one who I'm serving. He is the one who I'm pleasing. And so when you serve, you are honoring God because you directly serve him. Now, I wish I could tell you that serving is always fun and that you will always be appreciated and that things will always turn out just the way that you need them to or want them to. <clears throat> but that's just not the case. And so we've got to spend some time talking about the reality of serving. Because Paul spends some time talking about the reality of serving. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, if you want to turn there, we're going to touch on that in just a second. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. Because the reality of serving is that sometimes it doesn't go the way that we think it will go. Or the, th or the way that we would like it to go. We don't get the reaction that we were hoping for. And on this point, we now turn to a man who had his master's degree when it came to serving Jesus Christ. Uh, in 2 Corinthians um, 
We'll start with actually chapter 11. I'm sorry. We're going to start with 2 Corinthians chapter 11 first. Uh, Paul gives a list of things that happened to him in ministry while he was serving. And I think what we're going to soon see is this is the reality of serving. Listen to what Paul says, starting in verse 23 of 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind to be talking like this. I am more so a servant of Christ. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers and from bandits. I've been in danger uh, from my fellow Jews and from Gentiles. I've been in danger in the city and in danger in the country. In danger at sea and from, and I've experienced danger from false believers. I have labored and I have toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and I've known thirst and I've often gone without food. I've been cold and I've been naked. And besides all of these things, I face daily the pressures of my concern for all the churches. Are you getting the picture that Paul is painting? Are you seeing the reality of serving? Because here's reality number one that I think Paul makes pretty clear. Serving sometimes hurts. Serving sometimes hurts. And it's inevitable, really. Because when you pour yourself out so much to give to somebody who has a need, when you've emptied yourself because you have such a deep love and care for them, it leaves you vulnerable. This could be the summary sentence, could it not, of Christ's earthly ministry? Jesus was all the time serving others, and sometimes it hurt. Remember Isaiah's description of the Messiah who was to come in Isaiah chapter 53? He was talking about Jesus coming, and if you know anything about Isaiah chapter 53, you know that it's kind of been summarized by the title of the suffering servant. Jesus knew full well that sometimes serving hurts. Listen to Isaiah's description of Jesus. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. I mean, that's a description of Jesus' ministry. As he served, he was despised and he was not esteemed. Serving sometimes hurts. You probably might know this, but the Greek translated, the Greek word translated for servant is doulos. But did you know that that's the same Greek word that is also translated slave? And I don't think that's a coincidence. Um, Slaves are often mistreated. But as we are slaves to Christ, it's not our master who mistreats us. It's the ones we're trying to serve. You ever tried to to help somebody who had a need only to have your hand slapped away? Have you ever gone out of your way to provide something for someone only to have them complain that it wasn't good enough? Have you ever met with somebody? You sat down with them. You heard their sob story of life. You gave them scriptural godly counsel and advice. And after you invested in them, after you spent time walking beside them, they made the wrong choice anyway? That stings. That burns. That hurts. Here's the reality of number two. You won't always get what you deserve in this life. You won't always get what you deserve in this life. In case you're new to this fact, life is not fair. The good guys don't always win. The right isn't always appreciated. Listen to Paul's words in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. He says, We are hard-pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not hopeless. We're persecuted, 
but we're not abandoned. We may be struck down in death, but we're not destroyed. Do those descriptions of what we receive here in this earth, on this earth, seem very fair? Does that sound like the kind of treatment deserved by people devoted to serving God? You don't always get what you deserve, but listen, because there's another side of this coin. Be thankful you don't always get what you deserve. Because the reality is, you and I, we deserve hell. We deserve hell. If it were not for the grace of God, we would endure hell. So remember that the next time you're complaining about not getting what you deserve, because that's not always a bad thing. The fact is, in the lives of all those who seek to serve, there will be times of reaping negative consequences for speaking truth or for doing what is right. And in those moments when it's hard and when we're unappreciated and it hurts and we haven't gotten what we thought we deserved, how do we continue to serve? How do we continue to do what God would ask us to do in those moments? Well, I think it's important for us to understand how to cope with the consequences, to, to deal with the reality of that sometimes serving hurts and we don't always get what we... There's got to be some things we, that, that is going to help us deal with that and, and to continue to serve and not give up. Two truths in coping with the consequences. Here's the first. Nothing touches us that hasn't first passed through the hands of our Heavenly Father. I want that to sink in. Nothing touches us that first has not passed through the hands of our Heavenly Father. Does that bring comfort to you? It should. It should. Because that means that God is fully aware of what is happening to you, of what you've received, of how people have treated you. Nothing touches us that hasn't been allowed um, first by the sovereignty of God. He has looked at it, he has surveyed it, and then he's allowed it. And that brings comfort. That's how I can continue to serve. God, I don't understand why I, uh, this is happening to me or, or why I was hurt when I emptied myself out and to serve in the way that you've called me to serve. I don't know why that happened. But I understand, God, you're in control. Here's the second truth to help you cope. Everything that we endure is designed to prepare us for serving others more effectively. Everything that happens to you has been allowed to happen to you to make you a better servant. Does that blow your mind? That's what Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. He says this, he says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our troubles, so that, when we, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort that we ourselves receive from God. The reason I'm going through the things I'm going through is that when I move past whatever I'm going through, when I put that in the rearview mirror of life, I can move forward and help others who may be just going through what I just went through. And I've been there and I've done that and I know how I felt and now I know what I can do to come alongside you and help you. Everything we endure is designed to prepare us for serving others more effectively. I hope that's of comfort to you. So we've talked about the purpose of serving. We've talked about the reality of serving. I want to spend the rest of our time talking about the reward of serving. If you would, please, humor me in this. Finish this sentence. No good deed goes unpunished, right? You've heard that before? I got to tell you, that is the truth according to the world. That's the truth according to the world. That's their reason for not getting involved. That's their reason for staying on the sidelines and not serving. Hey, it's not going to benefit me anyway. It's going to blow up in my face. Here is the truth according to God's word. For those who would choose to follow Jesus Christ, here's the truth. No good deed goes unrewarded. No good deed goes unrewarded. Jesus assures us in Matthew chapter 10 verse 29. 
He says, not one sparrow, what do they cost? Two for a penny? Can fall to the ground without your Father in heaven knowing about it. So if our Father in heaven knows about it when two little worthless birds drop dead, okay, I can guarantee you that he will not miss knowing how faithfully you have served by mowing your disabled neighbor's uh, yard each week. He's not going to miss the fact that you go visit the shut-ins. He noticed when you selflessly volunteered to do the, the work behind the scenes that nobody else wanted to do. He sees it. He remembers it. But more than that, he promises to reward it. Let's look at some facts about rewards. Now let me just state this from the onset. I have no idea what rewards will be or what they will look like. I mean, in my book, any day that I get to spend in heaven is a pretty awesome day, okay? But the Bible would seem to indicate that there are some rewards to be received. And 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I believe, is one of those areas where it talks about rewards. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, verses 10 through 14. It reads, By the grace that God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than one that is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold or silver, costly stones or wood, hay or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and fire will test the quality of each one's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. From Scripture, we learn uh, three facts about rewards. Here's the first fact. Most rewards are not received on earth, but rather in heaven. In verse 13, it says, Their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. Did you notice maybe in your Bibles that phrase, the day, day is capitalized. It is the New American Standard anyway. What it's talking about there is the day of judgment. On the day of judgment, when we all stand before the throne, before our Heavenly Father, everyone will give an account of what they've done. And for those who are in Christ, where the promise is that I will remember your sins no more, it's not the bad stuff that's going to get brought up. It's the good stuff. It's the things that we've done, the work that we've done, the service that we've done that will get brought up. But most of that is going to happen on the day of judgment. It's going to happen in heaven. Fact number two, our rewards will be based on quality, not quantity. The last half of verse 13 says, It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. Um, they're going to be revealed with fire. It isn't the size, the volume, the noise, or the numbers of works that impress God. It's the heart's motive and the authenticity with which those acts of service were done. That's what God cares about. Here's the third fact. No reward that is postponed will be forgotten. Verse 14 says, If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. No reward that is postponed will be forgotten. God doesn't settle his accounts at the end of every work day. Nor does he close out the books toward the end of a person's life. But be assured, when we step into eternity after this life is over, no act of service will be forgotten by God. I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about God's promises to his servants. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus is describing what judgment will look like. And he compares it to shepherds separating sheep from goats. And Jesus is now talking to the sheep, the righteous servants. And in Matthew chapter 25, verses 34 through 40, Jesus says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. 
I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When do we see you a stranger and invite you in or, or needing clothes and clothe you? When do we see you sick or in prison and come to visit you? Then the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for the one of the least of the bro brothers or sisters of mine, you did for me. Two promises that I want to point out from these verses. Number one, God won't forget. God won't forget. He remembers everything. Nothing that you have done will slip through the cracks. And when we serve others, it's as if we're serving Christ himself. He makes note of it. And his memory is long. And he won't forget. We may not remember. Lord, when, when did we do that? He will. And that's a promise. Here's the second promise. His eyes notice all the service that you do. From the biggest sacrifice to the smallest sacrifice, he sees all of it. In the moments when it's easy to serve and when it's fun to serve and when there's smiles on your faces to the moments when we're stretched beyond what it seems we can handle. He sees it all. As I conclude this morning's sermon, I simply want to ask you two questions. How are you serving? And, and why are you serving? Because the answer to these two questions will identify the purpose of your service and the area of your service. You see, serving isn't easy. That's why it's a discipline. I simply want to end with some verses from John chapter 13. This, I believe, is the second greatest act of service recorded in Scripture. The greatest act of service is Jesus Christ stretched out on a cross, dying for the sins of the world. That's the greatest act of service. Here's the second greatest act of service. It's Jesus washing the disciples' feet. The creator of the universe on his knees before stinky, smelly, slimy, gross, disgusting feet. Washing each one with care, with tenderness, with love. And after Jesus washes all the disciples' feet, all of them, including Judas Iscariot, who was to betray him, this is what Jesus says to them. He says, For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. There's a big difference in knowing that service, serving one another is important, knowing that serving one another is good, and actually doing it. May we each strive to excel in the area of sacrificial service.